been sitting here for a while. So we'll go ahead and just get started. I am Dr. Emanuel. I work at Avian and Exotic Animal Care right here in North Raleigh. We're an exotics only clinic, so no dogs, no cats. Uh, we see some pigs, unfortunately. Uh, but we get to see all kinds of other really cool things. When I was in vet school, one of my professors always started off her talk with what she called the credibility factor, which is why in the world am I up here talking to you? Who do I think I am? I'm just a short little person with a squeaky voice, so why in the world do I think I can talk to you about coral? So I wanted to introduce myself a little bit before we got started. Um, I grew up in Bridgewater, New Jersey, and if you Google us, you just see a video of our mall, so it's not really very exciting there. Um, I hightailed it out pretty fast and went to Roger Williams University in Rhode Island where I got a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology. While I was there, I did a lot of research on the common cuttlefish. They're one of my favorite animals. They're really cool, really underrated. The flashy octopus gets all the attention, but cuttlefish are pretty awesome too. Um, I also worked at a zoo in Providence when I was up there, and that's when I kind of started to figure out I might want to be a veterinarian, because I was really awful at research, but I really liked taking care of my animals. Um, so I promptly got rejected from vet school twice and then moved down here uh, to declare residency to try and get into NC State. When I was waiting, I worked at the Museum of Natural Sciences downtown for a little over a year as their curator of aquatics, which I like to tell people I paid my dues in the fish world because you can't really see, but this is me underneath a whole rack of tanks doing plumbing because I was the short one that could fit in the small spaces. And then they also put me in big disgusting fish tanks in Grundance to do all my cleaning. So I've paid my dues in terms of taking care of fish tanks, I promise. I did finally get into veterinary school um, where I got my degree in, I have a doctorate in veterinary medicine, but I'm specialized in exotic animals. And then in uh, 2017, just late last year, I became the first certified aquatic veterinarian in the state of North Carolina. There's only about 70 of us in the entire world. Um, and there, the, the cool thing is that there isn't a board for fish vets yet. Uh, we're kind of the hardcore weirdos among the weirdos, so there's not a lot of us, but this is the closest thing we have to a board. So I'm really excited to be the first one in North Carolina. I'm just, I've always been a fish nerd at heart, and I'm just maxing out my nerdiness as much as I can. So, um, <laughs> look at this beautiful slide you guys can't read. So, uh, what in the world are corals? Corals are comprised of two species. So, it's the coenterates and the tenophores. Tenophores are classically known as the jellyfish, so the comb jellies. You guys probably aren't super excited about those. But the coenterates are why you're here. So, those are called the two gut group. Very exciting. Um, but that comprises of your hard and soft corals, your anemones, and all your other fun guys. The big difference between our little tenophores and cnidarians and our coenterates is radial symmetry, and then the fact that some of them um, have nematocysts or stinging cells and some of them don't. So it's getting kind of nitpicky, and I'm going to turn my thing around because I can't even see. So if you're really, really nerdy, separate it again. Radial symmetry, nematocysts, how they structurally develop, and then the fact that um, they're really different to keep as well. So it's hard to see, but this is a picture of comb jellies in what's called a chrysal tank. You have to keep jellies in a chrysal tank because they're kind of dummies and they get stuck in the corner. And so you have to have circular flow, otherwise they're all gonna pile up on each other and the ones at the bottom are gonna die and it's very sad. Um, so <laughs> tenophores in general I think are cool, but they're not the most exciting thing to keep. That's probably not why you guys are here. Uh, everybody in this group are susceptible to microbial diseases, toxins, and actual trauma or injury. The cool thing about tenophores is that they have almost an endless life cycle. So when they get stressed or when they get injured, they actually revert all the way down to their little itty bitty baby stage. And then they regenerate from there. So it's really awesome. They're actually studying... I'm a nerd, I'm sorry. They're studying this really cool part of the cell and how can tenophores reproduce their cells over and over again without these cells aging. And so it may be some um, future evidence to help slow down the aging process and may have some cancer implications too, yada yada. <laughs> All right, so we gotta talk a little bit about coral anatomy because just because your coral looks really cool, I think it's really important to understand what it's actually doing. Coral are called colonial organisms, which means that what you have in your hand, your frag, is not just one animal, it is hundreds, sometimes thousands of animals. And then if you go down to the bacterial level, it can be billions of animals sometimes, all living in one little group. Uh, so corals are really cool because they adapted a long time ago to get these photosynthetic bacteria in their endodermis, or basically their skin. 
and these photosynthetic bacteria are called zooxanthellae. We're going to talk about bleaching and how zooxanthellae are super important, but that's kind of what makes coral hum. So corals are kind of like plants in that there's this symbiotic relationship. The zooxanthellae use photosynthesis to make oxygen and process inorganic compounds, make glucose, and then the actual structure gives them calcium carbonate and protection in organic compounds. So a whole coral can communicate from one end to another. It's pretty amazing. It's like a mint plant. If you ever had a mint go totally crazy in your garden and there's like a tendril all the way over there, but you know it connects to your original plant. Or like fungi, right? How mushrooms, you like kill one way out here and you're like, oh my God, they're still popping up. It's because there's this one nidus of growth somewhere that you just haven't found. We want that nidus of growth to keep going with corals, but it's kind of the same principle if that helps you understand it. They have a rudimentary gastrointestinal system, which is really cool too. So one polyp can feed the whole group. That's why if just one part dies, you don't necessarily have to worry about it too much. It could come back so they can all communicate and take care of each other. They're pretty awesome organisms, right? <laughs> they also have stinging cells called nematocysts, which come into play a little bit later. This is the dorkiest of the dorky slides, and I'm so sorry you guys can't see it, but I will try to explain it a little bit to you. Veterinarians are just starting to understand how cool coral are, and that there's something, some things that they do that we didn't think organisms at their level could do. These guys have immune systems, just like you and I do. It's amazing. So you can't vaccinate them against disease because they don't have called humoral immunity. They don't have bone marrow. They can't necessarily repeat these cells and kind of remember from the vaccine. But they can have rudimentary inflammatory responses. They can make their own antifungal and antimicrobial properties, which is really cool. They can regenerate themselves, and they can actually have some level of immunologic memory. So they can even recognize self versus non-self. So this whole idea of grafting, if you try to like do that, um, what was it? It was the pigeon rat thing they did in The Simpsons, right, where they tried to like stick them onto each other. You can't make like a mega franken coral because it recognizes itself and they'll separate themselves, which is really cool. That's some advanced immunologic memory for an animal that doesn't really even have a brain, which is pretty cool. Um, and then they also do some neat things. They have some weird, similar compounds that humans have in their immune system as well. So I think the first scientist who found that was like, oh my God, I know what that is. Holy crap, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, they don't always play well with each other, and that's an important thing to remember when you're designing your tank. You kind of can't willy-nilly put them all next to each other because they have those nematocysts, they have stinging cells, and they can actually, the softer ones can swing themselves and whap another coral if they're getting pissed off or they feel like something's encroaching on their territory. And then the other one's going to respond by making a ton of mucus and clouding up your tank and then it's just this horrible spiral. Um, but that's an immune response, right? That's a pain response. That's a stimulus response. That's way more advanced than we give these guys credit for. So it's pretty awesome. Okay, we're starting to get into some infectious stuff. The microbial band is the thing that you guys are going to hear a lot about if you've done any research on issues with coral. And what this is, is it's a delineated area of necrosis or spread of infection, okay? So most of the time you see the dead coral and you're going to try and treat the dead coral. It's already gone. There's nothing to do about that. The microbial band has made its way through it. She gone, leave it alone. You know, the microbial band is where you need to be targeting your treatment because that's where this bacteria, this fungus, or even this virus is starting to process its way through your system. So a lot of treatments for corals end up going right on the microbial band or just ahead of it on healthy coral. And I know that's kind of scary, putting a paste or putting crazy glue or something on healthy coral, but you have to stop that microbial band. And so that kind of makes sense, but our inclination is to kind of freak out over the dead stuff, right? Like maybe if I put something on it, it'll get better. Don't pay attention to that. There's a lot more important things to do. But how fast the microbial band spreads, the pattern where it spreads, the colors that it changes your coral, all of that can tell us more information about what the actual disease is. So not every coral disease can get treated by metronidazole. There are other things. I see the reef keepers laughing. <laughs> like, oh God, I've done that, haven't I? Um, so the microbial band's a cool thing. I'm gonna cover just a couple of coral diseases. Some of these you may never see in your tank, but it's important to know about, especially bleaching, because this is a huge problem worldwide, and it can happen in your little tank too. If you kind of overwhelm them with too much light or too much love, you know, you may have bleached out your coral. The moral of this story, before I even tell you anything else, is that corals can come back from bleaching. It's not at the end of the world, they can come back. One of my clients right here and she accidentally bleached her lobo and it's it's alive it's doing well she's doing well 
So increased temperatures are a big one, but also too much UV exposure, which makes sense, right? The Great Barrier Reef water temperatures are rising and there's also holes in the ozone. So more UV is getting through. That's what we're starting to see. More research is coming out and saying, though, that um, there may be some secondary bacterial infections. So just like when you get a virus, you get a cold and you don't feel good, something else may colonize in on top of that. The same thing happens to coral. So they're getting a little compromised. This super awesome immune system isn't doing its job as well. And then Vibrio, which is one of the most common marine bacteria out there, sees its foot in the door and gets in and starts attacking things. That's also when you can see ciliate problems start to happen. But excessive light, oxidative stress, um, all of these things cause these really sweet zooxanthellae that are helping everybody to flee the endodermis. There's zooxanthellae in the water. They can recolonize. It'll be okay. You just have to get things stabilized again. Um, especially when you're at this middle part, which you can't see. Um, when they're just bleached, they can come back from that. But when slime and cyanobacteria starts to grow over it, and you get this gross kind of brown coating, it's game over. It's time to take it out of your tank and start off because they, those guys can't come back. That actual skeleton that we talked about has been totally covered by algae and other things. Your zooxanthellae can't even get back in, so that's the sadness. But white plague is so much fun because you guys call white everything white plague. I love it. I was used to research for this, and I'm like, oh, there's like eight different things that could be white plague. It's really exciting. Um, so pop quiz, what is this? Yeah, that's the microbial band. So that's where you're gonna focus your attention because that's the big nasty right there. Um, Except, in the case of one type of white plague which doesn't have a microbial band, sorry. All of a sudden it just starts dying and, you know, I would say the same thing, just attack it where you see the level of death, but there's type 1 and type 2. We don't know too much about type 1, um, except that it's pretty, pretty nasty. It can only kill at 3 millimeters a day, which isn't too much. Type 2 goes at 2 centimeters a day, so, I know, apples and oranges, but that's, that's a pretty big devastation in your tank, so that can cause some serious issues. Um, it has a clear path of progression, whereas bleaching is kind of diffuse, right? But you can see white plague start to go through, and whether it starts at the base or whether it starts somewhere on out an arm or a branch, differentiates type 1 from type 2, too. Um, this is a huge problem in corals around the keys, so if anybody, you know, I'm going to come back to this at the end, but use a lot of caution with your wild caught wild collected corals because you could be bringing in something like this you have to be pretty careful um, and a lot of your domesticated corals or like the home raised ones haven't been exposed to this and so it's not like they can really remember it but you're going to get some more devastation from something that's never seen it aspergillosis is a nightmare for avian veterinarians and when i found out that it can attack reefs i was like no because it's the worst it's the worst um, but classically, it hits these Gorgonian corals, so your sea fens and your sea fans and your sea pens. The cool thing about it is that you always get these circular purple lesions. So that's what I was talking about. Where your microbial band starts, how it spreads, what color it is, can always tell us what's going on before we even get a chance to diagnose your coral. But this is pretty cool. There are treatments for asper, but unfortunately they take a really, really long time. Um, even in birds, most of the time the birds die before we get it all the way treated. So this is a nasty. Um, but it's something to watch out for. At least it really only affects your Gorgonians. You don't have to worry too much about everybody else. Repetition necrosis is probably the ones that you guys are most familiar with. It's also lovingly called brown jelly disease. You guys have the best descriptions ever here. But what's going on is the soft tissue is actually necrosing and lifting off from your skeleton underneath. This is like bleaching on steroids. If a coral can hemorrhage, this is hemorrhage. Like this is just, everything's coming off. And again, usually there's an initial insult, so an initial trauma, initial bacterial infection, that then gets colonized by a secondary issue. And then once these coral react to that, they're like, oh, all right, game over. Um, but it, it literally is like jelly, so it's like snot just coming off of your coral, and it's heartbreaking, it really is. It's really important to know to differentiate this from a heavy mucus layer from an irritated coral, somebody that got whapped by their neighbor, or you know, you've got a water quality issue, they're starting to show evidence of bleaching, they're stressed. This doesn't necessarily progress into repetition necrosis. They're kind of two separate things. But the bad part is we don't know a ton otherwise about what starts repetition necrosis. We just know that sometimes within 24 hours, all the coral effects can be gone. So that really sucks. Um, this is the kind of thing where when you see this, stress or no stress, you want to isolate this coral and get it out as fast as you can. And then you want to be checking your tank to make sure there's something else going on. Red bug disease is one of my favorite 
favorites because like other veterinarians treat fleas and I get to treat copepods on corals, which is really fun. And we use the same drug. So this is a drug called Interceptor, um, which is a chitin synthesis inhibitor. You have to be really careful using it though because there are other animals who have chitin in them, right? Like shrimp and other little fun little cleaners that we like to have in our reef tanks. Because if you're doing your reef tank right, in my opinion, you have a variety of species in there. You have a good little ecosystem. Unfortunately, crustaceans come with that. If you just dump Interceptor in there, you're gonna say goodbye to all your sweet little cleaner lobsters and shrimp and good stuff. Um, but it's a really neat thing to use. A word of caution, um, there are a lot of, I have a lot of word of caution, I feel like, but um, there are a lot of websites out there now that are selling veterinary drugs without a prescription. You have to be really careful about that because oftentimes it's off-brand, it's come from an unapproved manufacturer or a factory, it hasn't been tested for safety, the expiration date may be wrong, and it could be mixed with things that you don't know about. And so my recommendation is always to get a veterinary drug from a veterinarian. I know it's inconvenient, um, but you could end up adding more things into your tank that you don't want if you're not careful. So there have been cats that have died from approved medications that somebody got on a website because there was some other additive in there that expired. So, remember that. Um, this is ciliate. They're horrible. They're horrible little creatures, but they respond really well to metronidazole, which is great. So I have a tool in my toolkit to kill these guys. Um, but white syndrome is kind of colloquially termed for your zooxanthellae leaf. So it's kind of like bleaching, but there's also a ciliate infestation in there. Okay. Um, we're also starting to implicate ciliates a little bit more in brown jelly disease potentially in rapid tissue necrosis. They're just hanging out in your water and there's nothing you can do to get rid of them in your water. Normal water has a ton of stuff in it. If you've ever looked at seawater under a microscope, which again, like nerd, I've definitely done that, um, you will be horrified and you will keep your mouth so closed every time you're in the ocean. A nightmare, it's the kind of stuff, like the monster inside me, that show about parasites, like that's how it starts, looking at river water and ocean water under the microscope. Um, so these guys are everywhere, but we do have some weapons to treat them, which is great. First steps when you diagnose an issue um, with your tank. I'm so glad you guys can read this. Um, always check your tank parameters. So it's the easiest thing to do, right? Check your temperatures. Check your UV output. Make sure none of your power heads have stopped working and flow is missing a corner of your tank. Make sure somebody hasn't died in a corner of your tank. Like, I don't know. People really like mussels or clams, not necessarily tridacna, which stay up, but like some of the other species that bury. If you don't bury those guys in a flower pot so you can check them every once in a while, they could die and you'd have no idea. And all of a sudden you have a huge ammonia spike, everybody's dying, and it's chaos. Um, also, resist the urge to start dumping stuff in your tank before you've done water quality and before you've done a water change because I see that so often with my freshwater clients. They like literally go to the store and just do this on the shelf. And I come in, I'm like, okay, what have you done? And they're like, well, I did this, 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 and this. And I'm like, did you change the water? And I'm like, no. First I did not. So, you want to, you can see copepods and red bugs just grossly. You don't need a microscope. You don't need like nerdy magnification goggles. You can see little red bugs falling on your coral. If there's something localized and you think it's worth the stress of fragging out part of your tank, isolate, isolate a frag if you can. Because I have a better chance of helping you treat it if it's isolated. And then we don't have to bomb your whole tank with something if we think it's localized. So that's a good thing too. My biggest addition here would be prevention. And you guys are here because you're trying to buy from reputable sources, people who know what they're doing. They've examined what they you know, have, and they know their names, and they know where they came from, and they can tell you when they were fragged, and how they've been growing, and what they've been feeding. That is so important for this, because you put so much time and so much money into your tank. My just advice is to make sure you get from a good breeder. So, um, I also am a huge fan of quarantine, and I know quarantine is not that fun, because you're gonna go home and you're gonna have these frags and you're like, ah, I just wanna put it in, I'm so excited. Please, please, please quarantine them, please. Because you never know what they have crawling on them, growing in them, spraying from them. Or if you bought some live rock today somewhere, you never know what's hitchhiking. So it's a really good idea to practice quarantine. Quarantine doesn't need to be super fancy. It can be a five or 10 gallon tank with a sponge filter and a little bit of light. It's okay, that works for me. I usually recommend 30 days. Most people are impatient and do seven to 10. I'll be happy if you quarantined at all, okay? 
Um, and then in some cases, like in fish, it's a good idea to have some medical protocols in quarantine too. Saltwater fish can tolerate a brief freshwater dip, and that gets almost all the ectoparasites off of them. It's pretty amazing stuff. So just freshwater, dechlorinated for God's sake, dechlorinated freshwater. No bleaching of our fish. There are ways that you can treat your beef tank at home, but there's also ways that I can help you, and that's kind of why I wanted to do this today. I want to tell you that, hey, there are vets out there who know what they're doing, sort of, and ways that we can help you beyond what you can get at a store or at a fish tank. So sharp debridement is one of the biggest ones. That's veterinary speak for fragging. <laughs> okay, so even if you can cut off an affected piece, that may help. If you've got a microbial band isolated to just one arm or one branch, you're gonna, you're gonna cringe and you're gonna be real mad at me that I told you to cut it off, cut it off. It's like cutting off the diseased arm or if you're in that like 47 hours, the guy who got his arm stuck in the thing, and he... Not, I'm not advocating that you chew it off physically. Sharp, sharp debridement, okay? Um, neomycin and canamycin pastes aren't always available over the counter in the concentration that's really effective, but that's something a vet could help you get compounded. And those are really amazing. You can just apply that right on your microbial band and you stop it in its tracks. So that's pretty awesome. Um, we can compound these pastes into all kinds of things that are really benign and don't hurt. In some cases, we even add them into cyanoacrylate, and so we're literally putting crazy glue with antibiotics over your microbial band. It works really well. It's pretty awesome. Um, Chloramphenicol is not available over the counter because that's what's called a restricted drug, meaning that if somebody willy-nilly gives it to their cow or their chicken, it's bad news. So you have to get that from your veterinarian, but chloramphenicol works amazing for a lot of issues as well. Tetracycline you can get over the counter, probably not in as concentrated a dose as we can give you, but you can get it over the counter. Uh, Lugol, levamisol, that's basically athlete's foot treatment, levamisol. That works really well for fungal issues. Um, and then medicated food is something that I'm really passionate about. We're just starting to learn about gut loading and is this a good way to target certain species to get antibiotics in them. So you can actually culture brine shrimp with chloramphenicol or with tetracycline, have them gut loaded, target feed your little corals, and then they're getting a systemic dose. Because remember, they have that community gastrointestinal system, so you can actually medicate your whole tank that way. And then you can target just one little coral if you need to. Pretty neat stuff. I'm, I'm biased for sure, but I think it's pretty neat. And then good old crazy glue. Cyanoacrylate works like a charm. You put that over the microbial band, that works pretty well. Um, I shouldn't tell you to do that because none of you guys are going to come and visit me. But have crazy glue in your uh, in your reef kit, okay? And then a last ditch effort, you may have to frag your tank and destroy a bunch of it. It's really sad, but I think reef keeping is kind of one of these like ups and downs things, right? Like you have such wonderful like highs when your tank looks beautiful and then something slumps and you're like, oh my god, why did I do this? All right, so here's my little plug. Why I'm a veterinarian. If I haven't already said it, don't trust drugs from the internet. We have the good drugs. And I think I say that on my next slide, I literally say we have the good drugs. I'm like your dealer here, okay? Um, you can get prescriptions. You can access me through my email or through my phone when you have a question. I have clients that email me photos of their tanks back and forth and that saves us a trip or an effort to do something a little more advanced. I can provide emergency care. If I can't do it, I can find somebody who can. Um, the exotics people especially, like we're this super weird subset of veterinarians and we all know each other and so we know people all over. We're like this creepy mint plant basically. Um, but I also practice herd medicine with reef tanks, right? So I'm not going to charge you for every single like coral you have me examine. We're going to come out, if you want to do a house call, we'll do one exam fee and I can get a whole picture of what your filter looks like, what your tank looks like. I can bring some tools and I can help you out. Um, so a lot of us practice that too. It's not as expensive as you think it might be. It's actually probably a lot less than some of the frags that are on sale today. Um, and then the cool thing, what I really like about my job is that I'm going to be learning from you guys. So you know more about your specific species of coral you're bringing to me than I do. And that's okay. I want to know what you know. I want to know what you're feeding and where you got it and how it's working in your tank. Because I may not know that exact species, but I know a ciliate when I see it on a microscope. So that's where I come in to help you out. But I love increasing that knowledge. And you may help somebody down the road too. If you teach me something about your coral, I could have somebody a year later that I can help because it's something you passed on to me. So it's kind of hippy dippy, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, and then for any of you guys who are keepers, <laughs> you can like put that horrible like organic uh, farm-raised health guarantee on your coral, right? If you have somebody to come out and be like, a veterinarian like poked at it, and yeah, health guarantee. So not that I'm advocating skeezy sales tactics, but it's there if you need it. So the other reasons about why to have a veterinarian that you can't read. 
Um, I can give you something beyond a shotgun treatment. So I can give you that next step beyond going to the pet store and dumping all the bottles in. I can give you scrapes and impression smears. I have the ability to make those and read those in-house. And that's going to give you the next step of telling you exactly what bacteria or fungus is causing your issue. I can also do biopsies. So sharp debridement could also be considered a biopsy. We have veterinary pathologists who are aquatic specialists who would love to get a chunk of coral in the mail. And we have access to that that you guys might not. Nutritional support is one of my passion projects again, so I'm here to help you figure out how to feed your tank the best, if there's systems that we could be doing for your fish in your tank too. Fish nutrition is one of the things that got me interested in what I have now, my certification. Because there's so many cool things that aquaculture is feeding their fish now that hobby just hasn't caught up to yet. So sustainable sources of fish meal or alternatives to fish meal to help overfishing, like a lot going on. <laughs> and I can also do bacterial and fungal culture. So something as simple as swabbing can tell me exactly what's growing kind of. That's pretty awesome. A lot of veterinarians practice a holistic approach too. So again, I'm going to be the one who can say, hey, you've got crustaceans in there. You probably shouldn't put interceptor in this tank. That's a bad idea. We can take a global picture of your whole tank and what the best way is to take care of it. And you can't see it, but we have all the good drugs. I promise you. Yeah. Oh, that got picked up by the mic. Did you hear that? <laughs> if nobody gets anything else from my talk, it'll be we have all the good drugs as veterinarians. So. <laughs> um, and then we have really weird senses of humor, so this is kind of hard to tell, but up here is a lion head rabbit, and his name is Hadron, and underneath is Jeruna parva, which is this sea hare nudibranch. It's super popular in Japan right now. It's, it's called a sea bunny. And I told his mom, I was like, do you know what your rabbit looks like? And she knew already, which is awesome. So she's kind of a fish nerd too, but I have cheesy jokes like this to keep you entertained as well. All right, so resources to find a vet, and I can write these down too for anybody. You can take a picture of my slide if you guys, this is probably the most important information. Um, the American Association of Fish Vets is the umbrella organization for what I got certified through, and they actually have a find a fish vet locator. So veterinarians have to come onto the website and say, yes, I am here, I am willing to see fish. So we can't just like get put on there without our permission. So anybody who's on that website has some fish knowledge, knows what they're doing, and is willing to see you in your fish tank. Local vet schools, universities, and extension services, even if it's just aquaculture, may be able to direct you in a, a, to a certain person. Hopefully they tell you to call me, that'd be awesome. But um, they have some really good information too. And most extension services are really inexpensive, so they're a good option. And then the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association is the group that certified me. Um, they have an international coalition of all kinds of vets all over the place doing weird things. They also have some really great continuing education on their websites, most of which is free to access. So uh, if I've sparked the like nerdy excitement in coral immunology today, you might be able to find some more information on WAFMA. They do a really nice job. So. Um, and that's it. You can't really see, but that's um, me with my, he was one year old and he had uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease like they get in daycare, or hand in, hand in mouth, something like that. Anyway, I had a fish necropsy and I put him in the carrier and he's just laying like this, like. Um, and then I always thought this was funny, save the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. I had somebody ask me if that was a real thing. And I'm like, you should not buy any coral today. <laughs> like, um, I'll be hanging around for a while. Our table is right there. We have magnets and business cards. I'm happy to answer any of your questions too, but thank you so much for dealing with not being able to see anything and probably not being able to hear me. Thanks, guys. That would be nice. Um, like I said, I'm happy to email this as a PDF to anybody too. If you want to stop by our booth, if you didn't get to see anything, you have questions, um, write down your email for me and I'll email it out as a PDF. So. Yeah.
overdo the copper and have a huge problem. But um, the, the American fish vets have a meeting every year, and we had like a whole hour where we were all pretty much yelling at each other about copper and like people who like to use it, people who don't like to use it. And the person giving the talk basically made us do math at the end. Like she put up math problems. It was like if you're gonna use four of a cool like copper, you're gonna know how to use it. So I think um, used judiciously, copper has a place. But you're right. I worry about sensitivity with other animals and fish. fun or glamorous is in testing kits. Like really, it's, it's easy to get the super cheap dip strips, but if you want to be good at this and if you want to be proactive, spending the money on getting a good test kit makes a huge difference. So. And I like a spectrophotometer, so I'm like a mega nerd, huge nerd. I know, that's like really intense. Oh, come on, man. If you get a $400 frag, you can get a spectro. They're so much fun. Um, the ones that come in the blue boxes that look like index cards. Yeah, and then there's another brand, too, that I'm blanking All right, on right now. And just in case you were here earlier, we've got some new items down on the far side of the table. Uh, we have to take a look at some Partially, but it's uh, also like giving a ton of training dose. We've got some props from... Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. It's pretty cool uh, stuff. Uh, the other thing that's really cool, if any of you guys keep fit, too, there's a new study that I'm playing around with. Marina, our intern, saw it in action. The um, OxyCat, the Polyox bandage. So people are starting to use um, basically powdered liquid bandage and we're putting in antibiotics into it. And the cool thing is when you apply it to a powder to fish skin, it actually turns into a gel. And it's one of the only things that I've found to stay on superficial ulcerations in fish. It's like, I put it on a tree frog and his, like, you could see muscle and bone because he had this migrating parasite. It was really gross. But anyway, after I got done pulling all these like spaghetti parasites out of his leg, it was really exposed and horrible. And within three days, it had probably reduced by 75%. Um, so it's got an anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial in it. It just sticks right on there. And you apply right, so it. It's around, really cool stuff. Yeah. So uh, I like playing with that. Yeah. And I'm always interested in what you guys are doing too. Like I like the super glue thing. I learned from a hobbyist, and so I'm I'm all about the super glue now. So. Is it permanganate? Uh, yeah. I've used it before, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like Prozzi for that too. Prozzi gets flatworms really well. And so Project Fossil is really awesome and you can do a concentrated dip. Or you can feed. So you can do like Prozzi Quantal gut loaded. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. And the, the fish keepers too are starting to do some really cool stuff with like nutraceuticals, so non-true medications, but like propolis, which is this resin that comes out of a beehive, has immunological stimulating properties, which is so cool. And so does garlic. And so putting garlic, this compound in garlic and propolis and all kinds of stuff in food can actually boost the immune system of your animals without truly medicating them. I'm just a huge nerd. I'm so sorry. I love it. It's really cool stuff. Vets are trying. We're trying to catch up to you guys and the cool stuff you're doing. So. Yeah. Fish so far. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. I love your stream. You know where to find me. We're the only one without corals. So. <laughs>